And now, Pushyami Gogoradi in the Isle of Man, written by Sarah Kaplan and Timothy Vovra. Never in her wildest dreams would Pushyami have imagined she'd be sailing by ferry to a magical, mysterious island without any clear destination. Yet there she was, with her new friends, a passenger aboard the grandest ship she had ever seen. They were given the royal treatment, complete with their own cabins, in full access to the ship's most special private lounge. The first thing they did was take a stroll along the promenade, admiring the views. Everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves, that is, except for Henry, who was leaning over the side of the ship, as if he wanted to drop straight into the ocean. Henry, my dear, are you all right? Lauren exclaimed, rushing to his side. You've been living like a nun on holiday. The ocean gives me the willies, Henwin replied, before bending over the rail with vigour once again. But Shammy left right away to achieve ginger rail from the cafe, which he promptly brought straight to the rather pale looking Henwin. Would you expect it uh, to be an experienced traveller, she asked doubtfully upon return. You look like you've never sailed before in your life. Once, answered the shaky henman, as he held on for dear life. Wish me da, but I was a wee lad, quite young, but since, no, never again. But Shammy stood back to give him some room. But your journeys, oh, twere all just adventures taken by land, you see. And would answer it in between, making an unexpectedly eager bows to the sea. I'm a land dweller by nature, as well as my bud. I'm supposed to be travelling only by land, because if I don't, ugh, his stomach feels for him. Why don't you go lie down for a spell then, Sister Bly? placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. Lauren and my dear, keep an eye over him. Of course, Lauren nodded. Anything for him. And she took Henry by the arm. Who oh, quickly right. Perhaps I'll go down the sea more often, he smiled as she led him in. Meanwhile, push at me, and the nuns continued their stroll by the port side. Oh, that most unusual symbol from this almost unusual island, be etched into the underside of an old bell, all the way back on the mainland. Sister Constance wandered aloud. It doesn't make any sense. Tis the ploy of flan, Bushami responded with a slug. Tis an ancient island of mystery. I suppose we'll understand more when we get there. In nearly three hours' time, they arrived at the port of Ding and were greeted by arrival in pleasantly calm weather, which inspired them to take a walk by the saintly shores of the bay. There was a path of tower stones on one side of the beach, which push Yami noticed was glowing that all too familiar strange glowing greenish hue. The cobblestone path took them at least a mile from the ferry docks along the shoreline, and it led them to the most magnificent lighthouse, whitewashed like the Irish cottages of old, but it had the most unusual sign, a different-looking fortress, and it was too curious for the crowd not to investigate. With one nod from Pushyami towards the towering structure, they took the old stone steps straight upwards from the beach. Curiously, the door had been left ajar, as though someone was expecting them. And there it was, a small wooden sign right above the door, with a most curious carving. It would become known to the group as a secret symbol, a pie skeleton, which contained three separate arms joined together, much like the legs of a familiar Archimedean shaped spiral of old. Except this most unusual representation, each arm was connected to a hand, which held in its palm an offering of pie. Goodness me, remarked Henry, why am I sadly so hungry? The most wonderful smells were wafting out towards them. It was like a feast, which I mean, your lips in glee. And when peered inside, you think our Augustus foes are all the way out here? Only one way to find out, which Yami proclaimed, and they all followed her inside the lighthouse, one by one. They followed their noses up a winding spiral staircase, where they met a very surprised looking guard, who was not in the least bit pleased to see him. Where in the name Flan did you not come from? He halted in his tracks when he saw Pushyami, followed by three nuns, then by a hesitant Henwin and an even more hesitant Lorna. Great following God proclaimed, You are Pushyami Gogarelli. The man immediately bowed, much to Pushyami's pleasant surprise, and took her by the hand and kissed it. And you are Henwin Hoogstein, a royal board.
He took Henry by the hand, but Henry didn't shake it. Do you suppose I am? Henry replied with a much amused nod. But no need to give me a kiss, thanks. You must be here for the festivities, the guard proclaimed. But Shammy was astonished. But I don't. Come, come. He ushered them all into the control room, where he used a secret passcode. Mayday. Which activated the secret staircase, upon which he ushered a group without fail. Then down one by one in a line, they journeyed further down still, the ground level foundation of the old lighthouse. The end of the ever twisting spiral staircase, an airtight pressure secure metal door opened to reveal a secret passage, which brought them directly into the hidden chambers of the island. Untold numbers of crevices of untold depths, containing underground rivers and unexplored caverns. The ancient pathway was lit by torches, though it was nearly impossible to see, until the guard handed them each a well-lit torch of their own. As they each accepted their torches, Koshiyami became aware that the passage was padded beneath them, which gave them better footing as they ventured out into this normally, unusually treacherous domain. Miss P, whispered Henry, as they followed the guard down the dark corridor without question. I think something very strange is going to foot. Once I'd have to agree, whispered back Pushyami, for I believe we've all been summoned. Whatever it is, whispered Lorna, as she joined them, can't all be that bad if they can cook a meal and smoke like that. Hush, whispered the guard rather fiercely as he warned about it. Though you in the corridor, sudden noises could cause tremors in the beams, he had, and with a nod towards the cavern's natural scenes, his path you tread as ancient. Please do pay your respects. He does he mean the cave? And whispered, eyes widening with awe, or, or then. Push Yami followed the light of his torch within her eyes through a series of ancient engravings along the walls of her cave to the left as well as the right. The engraving themselves appeared ancient, but the more she peered at these faces, the more she realized that they were familiar to her. They belonged to world-class entertainers from several generations, dating back far into history, as far back as Shakespeare himself. What is all this? Pushyami whispered to the guard. The whole of legends, replied the guard. All these faces have been here. But that's impossible, gasped Pushyami. And when stared transfixed, I think that's my granda. Come along. Lorna grabbed him by the elbow, hurrying him along. Where exactly are you taking us? Pushami inquired of the guard. You will see, the guard said with a smile, as he led them finally to another chamber door. The nuns remained curiously silent as they followed the leader into the underground channel. Finally, they arrived at another chamber door. The guard smiled again, opening it without a word. A door unleashed a stream of light, neon light to be exact. For beyond the doorwood there was a nightclub, complete with natural underground terrain, high cavern ceilings which won from magnificent, four old-fashioned, well-lit chandeliers. Racing the polished wooden floor, there were hundreds of populated round tables, each of which were draped with beautiful, purple and red satin tablecloth. Each table was lit by the solar candy candle, and the look on her patrons' faces were fixed upon a stage where an older man was singing lively rock music while playing electric guitar. The cavern's ancient walls only amplified the sound, and at first Pushyami thought Henwin was shocked by the salt on his eardrums. Only for her presumption, they had been aid to rest when Henwin gripped her by the arm, and increasingly exclaimed with wide-eyed astonishment, Good as me! Man's up there is my dear! He's serious, Lorna said, whispered back in equal shock. He's amazing! I haven't seen him in ages, Henwin whispered back, eyes shining with surprise and delight. I thought he stopped playing years ago. Come, I will introduce you. He took Lorna's hand, waving on her onward. Hardly able to contain their excitement, they scurried down to the front row, to the nearest sentry seats, to get a better view. Oh, sorry, sir, a major deal accepted. But these seats have been reserved for. That's me, da, exclaimed Henwin. Pointing and waving, da, he cried out, unable to contain his excitement. Da, it's a very end wind. As if on cue, all music stopped. Their microphone squeaked with protest, as did many of the very angry patrons, as he who stayed jumped down from the stage and drew his son in for a big beer hug. I don't never breathe, the elder Holstein proclaimed, and with me boy, I never thought to see the day. What is the name of planet you do here? Henwin laughed, 
I am the faintest. I suppose you've got something to deal with it. Well, whatever the reason is for the last. It's the best surprise of the century. I never thought I'd see your sea legs strong enough to come here. Who is it in I? And you smiled knowingly at Laura. Who smiled slightly back? And for the inner lady of lake, smiled eagerly upon me. And who, might I ask, have you brought down here with you? Ever the gentleman, you lean towards Lorna, taking her by the hand, and pressing it with a kiss. Oh, this is my sweet lady, Lorna, and when I so kissed her hand, if it was for her, I never would have made it. Oh, so you see, bless you, my dear, you beamed at Lorna, who could only once smile shyly and reply, and who the rest of your friends he smiled curiously at the noise. I didn't know you were a friend of the church. He whispered then. Sister Bride, I was of St. Mary's Church in Dingle at your service. Sister Bride offered an open poem. This here is Sister Constance and Primrose. We three have known this venue for quite some time. He confessed to the surprise of the others, but we were certain of its location. We have done nothing of significance to come here, except for Push Emmy. With that, she pointed at Push Emmy, who came to the light. Sir, she greeted you with outstretched hand. Did a pleasure and honour to meet you. You who stay nearly lost his footing. Goodness gracious, you actually Miss Gelger ready. Famous archaeologist and explorer. Well, Shammy laughed at the title, for she was not yet used to such labels. Hardly, she smiled, however pleased. I stumbled upon the lost pages of the Book of Kellis, while we were in our dumpling, only a week ago. Do not dismiss your success as insignificant. He who placed the kiss upon her hand, causing push every to blush, for your name has been spread to the four corners of the globe, my dear. You have been given a seat at the ancient round table, and we have been expecting your presence here for some time. Push Jamie blushed, and was about to ask how this could be, when the lights grew dim. The entire room began to glow, as if torches were lit on left and right, and a man appeared on stage, one who greeted him, the benefactor of the club. Who but a boo Khabib? Welcome to home, Bay of Wonder, Asus. You have been granted the most privileged of passages, the gift of the eternal summer's eve. You are now in the land of Tiranog, the land of youth, also known by some as Tear Fothuin. The land under the wave. Welcome, adventurers and visionaries, you brave mortals who venture through the lands of the mist and sea to arrive at Mayor Hornet's house, the land of May and summer everlasting. We will begin with the opening prayers. Bless all threefold, true and bountiful, myself, my spouse, my children. Bless everything within my dwelling and within my possession. Bless the kind and the crops, the flocks and the corn. And San Eve, the Beltane, with goodly progress and gentle blessing, and sea to sea, every river mouth, from wave to wave, and base of waterfall, be the maiden, the mother, and the crone, taking possession of all to me belonging. Be the world spirit of the forest, protecting me in truth and honour, satisfying my soul, and she my loved ones, blessing everything and every woman. Oh, my land and my surroundings, Great gods who create and bring life to all, I ask for your blessing on this day of fire. All men said up, and the lights went dim again. When the lights returned, a wondrous sight appeared, a fairy queen, a lady of May, surrounded by gardens of all kinds of flowers, grapes and rosaries. She was lifted from slumber, only to face the dark mother, a queen of winter, once again. The crowd watched hushed, Embraced and tranced as the fairy queen stood up in her against her dormancy, banishing her, and the Lady of May was whisked away with the green man, the king of the forest, and the crowd let out a roaring good cheer of ecstasy. As the night went on, with music and merriment, the caverns were filled with the delights of music and magical mystery, complete with maypole dancing, chanting a fanciful song. Two self contained bonfires were lit in the centre of the room. Sending sparks of wonder into the hearts of all who lived and danced about it. They were toast to plenty, a heaps of food fit for a king, like the one who strode with home and stayed and sat. I got two dimes in my pocket, I got two dimes in my hat, 
I got two dimes in the lining of my coat. I got two dimes in my fat. And entertainers continue to follow. The likes of which some had never been seen in ages. Whose lights would never dim. And whose words would always be remembered. One by one came the legends. Who delivered their offering. On a silver platter for all to hear. Like the current one. Who stood before them now. And spoke went forth. Man with the feeling went like years. He did it all in despite fears. He did it all with the sightseers. Who did it all for light beers with ice spears? He put his hand in the cat face. He won his hand in the rat race. And he avoided the rat snakes. He made a song in a mad face. He made his home the advanced base. Critical bit in the gas phase. He put his life in a lab case. They had to admit he had taste. With ever increasing inordinate amounts of downtime. No one wanted to put in. No one wanted to put in but hand well. That much is certain. Procuring the pudding, a certain recursion. Very portals, no memorials, cordials and fortunes, potions and pies throughout the years. Oh, that crock of holes, all covered in mold. Oh, that crock of holes, and it was untold. There was stuff in the fridge. Thankfully, not particular rest. And then comedy occurred. The tree tree. I've got a glasses idea. The glasses tree. Got too many shoes. I'm going to need a shoe tree. Oh, am I thinking to myself, I need a shirt tree. I need a pants tree. I need, I need a tree tree. There should be a store called the tree tree. You buy all the trees, the shoe tree, the glasses tree. They need to have a battery operated pants tree. And then what happens is, you lift from underneath, rotates around, operated so you can bring it camping. And if you, the pants, if they kept it on too long, would burst into flames perhaps. So what we're trying to do is have a store called the tree tree. Hopefully you'll join us. If you need more trees, present all of the different things in your life. There's just just an testing thing called ancestry. I have my misgivings regarding it. I think what might happen if I spit into this cup could be the end of it just being me. Could mean that there's clones because of this. I have to be concerned that my genetics goes out there and what these companies do with it is anyone's guess. They just do whatever they like with it. And you could say, well, we're probably 20 years from crispering away the perfect person. And in that circumstance, <laughs> it feels as if they could just totally copy, and you'd have to fight 20 clones, fight 20 clones of you at the same time, they've all been indoctrinated, you'd have to fight them, they're all ninjas now, what then? And now they have DNA tests for cats, and I wonder to myself, when's it going to end? When's it going to end? Are we going to have our potatoes genome sequenced before we eat it? This potatoes too, it's good to eat, it's been sequenced, they'd never make a clone of me, and I'm not efficient enough, that's why. So this Lighthouse of the Orcas movie, I was just enamored with this smoldering romance between these two mature adults. And then in the middle of it, this little doll boy, this autistic boy in the back. And there's this scene with these smoldering glares between these two mature adults. And then this autistic boy in the back. Beyond that, there was this fixation with him living near the ocean. And I always wanted to go back to this patch of the ocean. And I'm like, let him go back to the ocean, do what he needs to do. Because that's what he wants to do, because his fixation to step into the ocean, never return, you'll never save him. And because he's just secretly a merboy, and he wants to return to the ocean. That's why he's so weird, you can't constantly supervise a person to make sure they don't step into the ocean, when they shouldn't be living near it. During intermission, they feasted on the finest food and drink that Mayor Wanesos had to offer. The May wines and mead, and the pile of most notable pale nails and whiskies. At some point, Lorna noticed that Henwin wasn't at the table. She found him over by the crog bowl, scooping large amounts of hard cider into a rather curious-looking sign. 
It looked almost not like a stein, but instead rather like a cornucopia that had been filled into the brim, with the point of sloshing everywhere, and when included. And when looked quite as sight, his face was bright red, as though he'd just a run a marathon hoofing it up hill in cold weather. He was swaying to and fro as if in a stone, kicking hysterically like a schoolboy. Edwin Houston, Laura snatched his arm and pulling him into a corner. Have you gone away with the fairies who look right hammers? And why not give it Edwin? Tis the most fanciful of festivities. I'm having to crack a barrel over time. And with that he placed a wreath of roses on the crown of her head and kissed it, laughing gaily. And Laura couldn't help but join in the fun. Together them two, they danced and pranced about the fire in the napole, and soon it was time for another round of performances from the stage. There stood the man of the hour, a dapper gentleman, in the highest honour. She was a market for lube, and I found this one called Rock and Roll Lube. It's a little pricey, and not about for the longest time. I had it with jealousy, I had to think about it. it's costly stuff. Finally, I looked into it, and I thought I could splurge. I could treat myself on this rock and roll lube. We deserve it. So I look into it and it says, Strategically improves pedaling and shifting. I didn't expect it was that type of lube, but apparently it was. I'm glad I didn't order it, because of the burns. It's good for a baked bike chain, but maybe not so good for other things. Garters in the history of mankind. My wife asked me what a garter was, and I had to tell her. It's like suspenders for your stockings. It connects your stockings to your panties. And it made me think of how silly it was. Like they didn't have these form-fitting stockings back then. They couldn't, so they were like long, fancy socks. They didn't conform to your legs. It just reminds me of these Japanese schoolgirls with their long, floppy socks and how they have to sew, hold their socks up. And instead of long suspenders for their floppy socks, they have this stuff called socks glue. It's like a glue stick they rub on their knees or whatever artificial place they hold it up to. Their ankles and whatever up to their knees. And it dawns on me. There's a strange Japanese man that manufactured the socks glue. He came to the idea that if you have to have socks glue, you probably put drugs in it. And just imagine all these, these Japanese girls, just 10,000 of them, just rubbing drugs on their knees all day long and thinking they're, they're rubbing these drugs on their knees just to hold their socks up. Meanwhile, First two is already always free. And you know what? In the process of this, Cowards wouldn't play. And I was alarmed. It was weird the recording of Cowards wouldn't play, but it finally played. Thank God Cowards played. And, and it's a weird place in Molyhead Island. There's a load of quarrying and debris. There's a load of quarrying and to do. There's quarrying and debris brought in on Molyhead Island. And a song from a performer. She's breathing like a freak of the wee. I can't get no sleep for the season. She's breathing like a freak of the wee. I'm giving me grief for no reason. She's giving me bubble and squeak and double and speak for the season. It's a unique technique with a bleak mystique for the season. I'm seeking for the meek and the sleep. I'm geeking for the booty and tea. She's giving me the free of the week and giving me grief for the season. I didn't mean to pull your hair, but there were too many possums, too many possums. Didn't mean to pull your hair, but there were too many possums, too many possums. They drank and danced the night away and into the day and night again. All the while pushing and kept her ghouls be close and her ears alert. The magical pies and potions of dead already were quite wonderful in their systems and near tummies, so it was quite synchronistic that she should meet the most unlikely person to get there on the regular, and he was known for oper running his operations from there. He's American. We have to look American. He sounds American only sometimes. He doesn't allow prejudice to cloud his judgment. He is highly unlikely, but it's the most contradictions in terms it could ever be. There never did exist this before in the world. Rule first most honest true there. He didn't make it by taking anything from anybody. He made that money from nothing. From his own honest inventions. That's how they were introduced to David Dedenor. And he was happy to share his plans with anybody who could get the dead already. And he was particularly proud that he could come up with such initiatives and see them through to fruition. And he had to ask no one's permission. We need to ensure that our rightful heritage of our world's resources can be protected as they are. 
we also need to take for the losers the task. It's not fair that some get to dunk their byproduct, poison into the groundwater, overfish the oceans. We have these companies pay to clean up to the highest standard of quality in regards to the methods and results. Denon or crude. Having multiple organizations researching these solutions to illness, the waste of effort, and less ineffective in pursuing real progress in medicine and other fields. We support open source medicine, pharmaceutical research. This means resources, educations, facilities, teams, and existing resource can be pooled and nationalized, potentially working to globalize that research data and research teams. We may tackle the major maladies of our age, aging, and all the illnesses we are subject to. There were ways of manipulating instinct. They were fundamental to his plans. He knew what was required from his new initiative was to cultivate the rise from the ruin. He knew that they were only a few paths that this earth could take. Nobody needed this planet to be an ocean planet or a desert planet. They didn't want it to be an ice planet. Honestly, a jungle planet is suboptimal. They knew that the best route for this earth was to become a forest planet. He asked no one permission. He held no elections. He needed no referendum. He silently built Factories everywhere clandestine. The factories made drones. The drones had seeds. Each drone plants as many seeds as it can. He had an idea for bamboo. He knew you could not only accelerate the growth of bamboo, you could pull toxic chemicals and undesirable chemicals from the soil and water. You could accelerate the density of carbon sink in a fabric material of bamboo. You could make clear striations in the bark of the bamboo, where the wind blowing across the bamboo will filter the air cleaning by just having bamboo growing and wind flowing through it. And so each of these was designed to be cultivated in a specific habitat they were intended. They cleaned the pollutants from the lands they were planted in. They filtered there, and enough of them were planted that they were able to set climate change back. The challenge now will be making sure they don't spread to an unbelievable degree, and the engineers of the bamboos have made it their interest to make sure that there wouldn't be runaway growth. Not only was it one of the most successful initiatives, but another of his project initiatives was coming to fruition. Project Instinct Mosquito. They wanted to make sure that they could solve two problems with one. Not only can we prevent the transmission of malaria and other diseases by re-engineering mosquitoes, so they no longer seek out humans to bite, but we also ensure that we have freshwater reservoirs on the coast. We do that by engineering these mosquitoes to seek out the mist from the coastal tides. And they hover just high enough above these tides that they collect sea mist, sea water, and their insides filter this seawater, much like they filter blood currently. They filter it into fresh water, so we are able to make a waste product, fresh filtered water. And our instinct is to deliver this water from the coast to the reservoirs that are designated for those who insist upon them, for those populations. Project Scanner is revolutionary, it has the potential to be the most disruptive technology of the coming tech generation. It's a handheld peripheral that scans anything you lay before it. It uses technology that was called together in pre-existing components. You can take that scanner device, plug it into your smartphone or laptop. And if you have a com chemical components database, your handheld scanner will be able to determine for you the exact material composition of what you scanned. It has the potential to revolutionize certification groups, these different approval groups, healthcare, Restaurant reviews, pharmaceutical industry. It has the potential to be incredibly disruptive. And a disruptive factor there is anyone can just crack on anything. The pills they take, the food they eat, what they drink, any old thing. And they can determine what is actually in it to a chemical degree. No one had invested interest in giving the public and other bodies and organizations that much power to understand and discover exactly what it is and what we see here in the world. And as this disruptive technology has been suppressed for some time, it's coming to fruition. And the third parties all over the world and enough manufacturing companies are making the prototype. And the goal of David Delon, he never needed it to be profitable. So his goal was to get it into the hands of as many people as possible, as soon as possible, for the lowest price. And a few other products like that, even more disruptive, products to protect people, make their lives better, to protect our health and well-being, products to descend and transcend the nature of mankind. Project Filter has been quite incredible. It's a multi-faceted multi project. There's elements that are shocking the good 
Alien, in fact, ways of making life so much better for next to nothing. But I can't even tell you about it. I wish I could tell you. It was Project Symbiosis that led us toward our greatest discovery. The project was meant to simulate biological systems of the human body in order to run accelerated clinical trials in parallel simulated human environments, potentially simulating a patient's individual genomic signature. It was these abilities that led us to the breakthroughs in autobiotics. One of the most grandest of all of them is something that's being called autobiotics. Most people thought to use CRISPR on animals, but he was one of the first to come up with the idea to engineer fungus, mold, bacteria, all the different elements, all the different forms of life. He was one of the first to use these forms of life, to engineer them in a way that makes them into perfect servants. It's approaching true immortality, not just immortality, but vivaciousness, endless youth. After all this thing, these inventions, you think you were visionaries? Choose Fern, exclaimed Henwin with exasperation. Those who had never heard Mr. Delanor speak of such topics found themselves intrigued, but they would know of other initiatives, inexplicably enough. It was not just a science, a true gentleman scientist, pursuing original ideas through cutting-edge innovation. It also put together the most timeless political platform of the century. If these ideas were allowed to continue, they would win. He's called every great discovery of the last 60 years. So it is why Mr. Delano is dead already. He was blocked in his own country, undermined at every turn. He was educated by his mother nearly alone. And when he outgrew the schools that failed him, he started a self-directed learning. He's a self-made man. His mother made him. What she made him is a strange joke. She wanted to make sure he could understand everyone. His mentality to when came towards understanding others was that it was especially beautiful to take the time to consider them each. Furthermore, with the Delphi group, we have a reconciliation of capitalism and socialism. We have a program that anyone could understand why we need to socialize the breadwinner. I'm for markets, and one of my favorites is the marketplace of ideas, where trade and ridicule among them is valued and prized, and when promising structure another to find purchase. I think the public conversation beyond the options on offer is myopic and needlessly so. If we're to reconcile capitalism with socialism, I ask you. The compromise between UVI and welfare state would be income supplementation by the federal government. One to two, one to three, on a gradient scale. This means if you make subsistence wages for every dollar you make, no taxes, and the government may give you a dollar. In addition, or beneath them, if you make less than sustenance, you make one dollar. The government gives you three. This means that the seniors and the youth, everyone else similarly unskilled, and making ten dollars an hour, now is taking home thirty to forty dollars an hour take home, with, the, with no government hands in their pockets, except to put a little hard money, earn, hard earned cash up in there. The degradation of the dollar means that it has lost a solid and unenviable amount of its wealth over the last generation. This means those wages that have not been commensurate with the increase in productivity and profit yields have not gone to the workers who have delivered these gains faithfully on a silver platter. It's well past time to cater to the hard-working families. If you're not on board with that, it's hard to establish a conversation. The aim is for you, your friends and your family, your community, and every other community around to prosper. They need a review of the nation, and people need to be able to choose how they invest their time. They need the resources in order to do so, regardless of their contributions to the market. The families that have no open market contribution to the community, aside from raising their families, are investing in the very fabric which society and civilization are composed. Unconditional support is the answer. What I propose up until now, a contradiction in terms that the state should unconditionally support its citizens and not have a say in how they choose to benefit society, that they are living a stable life, should not depend upon the market value of their labour. This transition should have been made during the dot-com boom of the 1990s, the data says. The when one detail that needs to be established in the mindshare of the world is that this generation and those going forward do face is not the ease of employment at livable wages and low living costs that the boomers have enjoyed through the decades leading up to this point. Without this perspective pervading throughout the discourse, it will be difficult to proceed with compassionate policies.
I don't have control over whether or people in comfortable and stable environments will wake up to that looming issue. But hopefully when automation hits the professional class, the way board will become clear. People are too hung up on what they have done before. Some people have a strange blend of pride and shame subordinating them from thinking about doing better. They cannot confront whatever they do might be done better. They can't bear to consider that what they have done so far to be somehow less than beneficial in any way. This shame slash pride is one of the primary regressive forces we need to overcome. Convincing people that improvements such as these doesn't condemn their prior behavior. That's critical to removing resistance to compassionate reform in any initiative. And there is more delectable conversation of the most insightful and philosophical nature. And there was much more joy to be had as the dapper gentleman returned with another presentation. This is a floating duck. It's a hammer look. It's a holy hook. It's interlock. It's a lady smoke. It's manioc. It's mental brook. It's overstuck. It's penny stuck. It's penny gin hook. It's pillow block. It's Pippin's Rook, it's Puppy Cook, it's Round the Clock, it's Sparrow Hook, it's Starting Block, it's Table Talk, it's Tomahawk, it's Vapor Lock, it's Voting Stock, it's Water's Clock, it's Widow's Hook, it's a Fighter's Clock, it's Yellow Dog, it's Against the Clock, it's Igneous Rock, it's Mosquito Hook, it's Posing Him Rock, it's a Stumbling Block, it's a Combination Hook, it's Metaphoric Rock, it's a Bangkok Boardwalk with Chalk Talk on the Catwalk, it's Deadlock on a Dry Dog, it's a Shamrock Peacock Sherlock, Goss Horses, Goss Hogs, Grass Finches and Gamecocks. It's the smoke of bliss, the smoke of bliss. I feel it, Mr. Reminis, the molasses kiss. It would behoove me to make it groovy. It would behoove me to make it groovy. <laughs> a boat dock on the sidewalk, and a small talk. Oh, it's a sleep walk. It's the abyss of my airlock. And the small talk, oh, it's a sweet talk. It's the abyss of the airlock, and it says that it's a sweet talk. It's the abyss of the airlock, and it's a sneak rock. It's a screech talk. Oh, on what might have been the third day beneath the green hills of the border of the Irish Sea, Hugh Hugstein approached Pushami and took her aside. Oh dear, there's a man I know in Anglesey, a man of science and anthropological studies, who's taken note of your discoveries, and would very much like to meet you. Poor Shemmy was delighted, and so they departed for Anglesey in the morrow. And that concludes the first of the three tales. Now, Poor Shemmy Gogoretti and the Cradle of Waves. Poor Shemmy would have never believed the two islands were connected by an underground passageway which ran the entire length of the Irish Sea between them. Yet here she was, with her two friends, Henwin and Lorna, and the three nuns, led by one Hugh Hoogstein, through this very underground passage. She took them all through the way to the Great Island, where they would meet their friend, Jacob Bramblethorn, a modern druid and a local conservationist. Before leaving the club, they were each given provisions of an apple each. And Henry was gifted a silver branch by Lorna, who would not impart it, as she received it from her first, which was a special gift for only a select few. Hold a branch up to your ear, she told him in secret, and you may hear the music of the fairies. And when was so tickled and pleased by the gift, he gave her a kiss, and enamoured by the motion, he was rolled around on the floor together. Oh, to be forever in the arms of love, said Hugh Hoogstein admiringly. May they ever be forever graced by God's love, proclaimed Sister Blythe approvingly. Amen. The other nuns agreed, and so they set off for the island on the other side of the sea. The tunnel was a long cavern hole that paved the way between the Irish Sea, adorned with flowers of many different kinds that seemed to grow out of the rock without soil and covered with moss, so you could walk barefoot without harm. Curious thing about this apple, Henry remarked at some point. I never seem to be able to finish it. Poor Shammy would have agreed that the apples were indeed strange, but she didn't confess to it. Wherever she bit into her apple, she would see visions. 
visions of a white horse, a black raven, a small falcon hawk, and a mind's eye. She also saw a silent white seagull appearing further down the tunnel, leading them forward through the mists. She knew not what to make of it, but simply journeyed on, joining with her friends as they followed her laughing and skipping through the corridors as they had not a care in the world. They emerged beneath the cliffs of the island through a partially submerged cavern through a semicircular door that looked part of the rock itself. All about them, high wind-swept cliffs stood overhead, and a greenish-blue sea spread out before them. Birds of all kinds flew to and fro, and they climbed the hill towards the lighthouse, and the path leading them towards the mainland. Pushyami caught a glimpse of the small hawk she had seen in her mind's eye in the tunnel. Goodness me, he's got a day in it. Henry wiped his brow. He's he agreed Push Emmy, as she sat to take a moment's rest. It actually feels like the middle of summer. A sudden voice announced, That's because it is. They turned to see a most curious-looking man leaning against a post. He was wearing simple clothes, and a lopsided brown hat, and carried a wooden staff, and a leather bag slung over his shoulder. Look! He brightened at the sight of him, walking towards the man with hands outstretched. My old friend Jacob! The two men hugged. Jacob! This is Miss Push Yammy Goga ready, sir. Push Yammy bowed, and Jacob kissed her hand. Did a pleasure, my lady, being Jacob Bramblethorn. Why, you suppose it's summertime, Henman asked, with confusion instead of introduction. You who think when Jacob was his contemporary, did not tell him where he had been. He was my old chief, said, Well, they know he'd been on me well in this house. Sir, Push Yammy required, inquired with eyebrow raised. The rest of the group waited anxiously for explanation. To wound him, Jacob urged, jabbing his comrade in the side good-naturedly. I put it. My one ace out is the entrance to Anwin, proclaimed Hugh begrudgingly, or Tira Nog in the Irish Celtic tradition. The cavern hole you were in is suspended in time. Three nights there can turn into three months. Three months have spent there can become three years. My friends, you spent a good three months, uh, three days in the hell with heavenly cold by some, and sometimes journey there once. They are done with mortal life, and a gifted eternal life without proceeding to tear a nook. It's kind of limbo, if you will, but never a purgatory, only a paradise, a land of eternal youth and beauty, and those apples you were given, once we left to home, those apples last forever. You will never go hungry, and they will provide you with constant nutrients in order to achieve your wildest of dreams. Goodness me! Henry looked about to fall off his seat. And why are you privy to such information? I'm a member of the Cade One Lethariel. Hugh informed his astonished son. We are an order of ancient magicians, who are ancient keepers of ancient knowledge, taking back to the time of the Druids and beyond. Oh, word, Edwin proclaimed. What else have you told me? Oh, right. You placed a smiling hand upon his son's shoulders. You were descended of the night. That, however, is my son for a tale for another time. Goodness me, Edwin did a little chick. I'm learning all sorts of news today. Pray tell, what day is it? Just one day before the summer solstice, you announced. Why, that means you'll be able to see the light shine through the Chamber at Bryn Celidu. Jacob exclaimed with delight. What's that? asked Lorna. To which Gooseby replied, Bryn Celidu is a prehistoric site on the Welsh island of Anglesey, located near Lestaniel Fab. Its name means the mound in the dark grove. It was archaeologically excavated between 1928 and 1929. Visitors can get inside the mound through a stone passage in the burial chamber. And the centerpiece, a major Neolithic scheduled monument in the center of Cad. The presence of a mysterious pillar within the stone burial chamber, the reproduction of a pattern stone, carved with sinuous serpentine designs, the fact that the site was a hinge with a stone circle, all may have been used to plot the date of the summer solstice, have all attracted much interest. What in the world was that? Jacob looked around. It's someone's phone on. That's just pushy at me, Sam. Henry the came, beaming at her and grinning at his dad. Boy, Jove! You smacked his forehead with shock. You owe to have a sham! Pushy Emmy hesitantly showed him the ramshack and brushing slightly. She announced, 
please meet my mentor and former boss, Gideon Goosby, who followed this version of Sam, which I like to call my Goosby gotcha. Sir, you who's been made of regal bow with the utmost respect. Jacob Brandlethorne, on the other hand, looked completely mystified, as well as completely baffled. Sam, he repeated, Goosby gotcha, what's going on? Hugh chuckled and laid his old friend by the arm. I'll explain later. To this crew, he said, You will not follow us. Take him. I believe you want to show us around Ireland a bit. You are in for a treat. Today's, today's festivities should pave the way for quite the sunset. Indeed, pushing him and breathed in with a quaint, healthy ocean air. With each breath, she felt more and more invigorated. Spreading out along the cliffs, the birds were gathered on the groups. Raising their young. When the waves were breaking, she spotted a new few seagulls flying overhead where both rose dolphins jumped and danced around playfully. On one of the rocks sat a seal, looking up at her longingly, as if yearning once again for land. Wildflowers of many kinds were growing everywhere, filling the air with their sweet smelly scents. First declared Jacob, Let us have some lunch. I'm starving. Should have spent some time with us at Mare One A, says my friend. You chuckled. You don't want for long. Have a bite of the apple, mate, offered Henwin with a knowing grin. It will last you lifetimes. Oh, thank you, Jacob chuckled, retrieving the apple from Henwin and taking a huge, hefty bite. Off we go, he regaled, to the greatest point of the island, where I will show you the grandest of views. Jacob wasn't only the views of the island summit. They watched the light stream from the ancient burial chamber. The rocky crag was the only thing save for a fortress there, built once long ago by the Romans. The area was populated by quartzite and heather, and the expansive natural, natural landscape took their breath away. It was a clear day, and they could see the mountain range of Ireland, way across from out on sea. Don't look ago, on the swift face, a myriad of puffin, razor bills, guillermo, and two of birds was gathering and nesting. Welcome to the spot known as the Signal, announced Jacob Ramblethorne. Holy head mines was marked there by the Romans, and then a monastery built by St. Sylvia's Church, at a medieval church near the Roman fort, constructed around 540 AD by St. Sylvia, a cousin of St. David. Goosby interjected suddenly. Why, oh, yes, nodded Jacob, easily impressed. That's exactly right. St. Sibby built the monastery first, and the church still remains here today. Oh, well, you heard of the church. It is lovely, and we would love to see it. Sister Blythe broke in the first time in a while, especially Jacob, who hadn't realised that the nuns were part of the group. Where did you three come from? Jacob asked as politely as possible, though frowning with some suspicion. I don't recall you here before. We were looking out at the birds when you arrived, explained Sister Blythe. I'm Sister Blythe of St. Mary's Church and Dingle. We were at Mayor One Ace House with Miss Gogoretti, Miss Lorna, Sir Hugstein, both elder and nurse. It was a rare pleasure that the nun should blush, but at this time one did. Oh, and Sister Blythe smiled at Henry, who looked amused. Junior, these three are associated with you, Miss Gogoretti? Jacob questioned, glancing at Hugh. With a raised eyebrow. They are indeed, Pushyami smiled from Jacob down to the nuns, and they have been proven to be invaluable in my mission and in my research. Sister Bly, Sister Cordelia, and Sister Primrose all rushed towards her and clasped their hands together. I see you are one and only most beloved Pushyami dear. And one was so enraptured and enamored by the moment that he said, Blessed is the stay of paradise, and he took the very same stein from Marijuana's house that he had been drinking all the while as a chalice full of goodies, and turning it around as if it resembled a horn, blew into it, once for peace, twice for hope, and thrice for prosperity, as he had been taught to do when young, and when he never thought it happened before, the ground began to shake, as though there was a giant quaking beneath their very feet, and a sound of bells that accompanied it rushing forth like a banshee, leading the way out of towards the sea of all directions. It's an earthquake, cried Lorna, rushing towards Henwin, who took a tumble to the ground, and stunned by the silence of the movement of the ground, it shook as suddenly as a hundred giants were descending upon them. My lord, you who stayed escaped. Why, Henwin, I didn't believe you woken up the cave. 
What is that you say? And when ruled about as he and Lorna held on for dear life. What is that you say I'm going and doing? The horn, Henwin. You pointed at the object lying beside Lorna. The horn. It's not a horn, Henwin laughed. It's a drinking horn. He used his blue pointed as if it were. Oh, I was going to fit the moment. Then push, and we heard a sudden cry from above. You have awoken me. The ancient one. From Hutara. A tree of life. The land of dreams. I, Moylan, have come to request your presence. As you are my request, the fabled lady of the East, who will become one with all the West, the land of the saints and scholars, the land of the sun, the land of the red and the white dragons. Everyone looked around for the owner of the woods, yet there was no one around. Gushyami fell to her knees in great reverence. Oh, she sighed, Sir Merlin, I bow before thee. Rise, boomed the voice of Merlin, and meet your newfound comrade and contemporary. For we are very much, in fact, the same, both you and I. But, for she only felt about to faint, as she looked about wildly for the ancient advisor. But I'm no magician, and I know no spells. You are the key, declared the ancient one, the daughter of the sacred grove, the keeper of cows, and your comrade, the true bird of Avalon. You blew the blessed horn and returned to this land. You alone have done the world much justice in your deed, though it may not be judgment day. The world is still in need. Now the hour is nigh. We must all gather when the green man, who is I, lies in wait for amongst their sleeping merry men, inside the cavern hole, who will not wake until one arrives who carries a stone. Destiny. No oh, destiny, Pushyami echoed. I have no such thing. You do indeed, replied Merlin. For it is a gift given to you by the fairies of the hill of Tara. The gift ruler to off the day to noon. And poor Shemi realized she was right, for there in her pocket was the very same stone with the strange markings carved into it. She held it toward the sky. Is this the stone we speak of? Yes, it is true. The stone of destiny, cried Murd. Good this me, Henwin exclaimed. What else have you been hiding out on? Tis all that I do believe, replied poor Shemi, though she wondered. Just how true this really was. Where be I, Sir Merlin? To which Merlin replied, I am in the sky, the earth, the sea, the face and the side of the tall green stone. And look a riddle, Henwin reclaimed, mystified. So now, reclaimed Minigrin, you must place the stone of destiny, which is in your very hands, inside the well, which lies in wait at the bottom of the stone. Together you must say three times, Merlin, Merlin, Merlin. And I will appear to be your guide. Well, I would mutter. And where shall we find such a will? In Cheshire Wood, past the Golden Stone, and beacon on the old Druid Circle, and continue on, past the Castle Rock. It was coldly suddenly piped off. Out of the edge is a village in civil parish in Cheshire, England. We just look for a tall green stone near the will, proclaim Pushyami with a nod of confirmation. Let us go immediately. They climbed into Jacob Brandlethorne's van, and less than two hours, without stopping, arrived at Alderley of Cheshire, where they quickly located a will, thanks to the locals' directions, the nearby tea house, and then headed quickly through the woods, past the ancient sandstone formations on the hilltop. As they walked through the woods, Goose be informed them. One of the classic locations for the study of Triassic sandstones in the UK is Alderley Edge in Cheshire. Numerous scientists from back in the early 19th century to the present day have studied the area in its popular fields like for universities around the UK. The sandstones also provide important insights into the natural nature of continental gas and petroleum reservoirs. The geology of the Edge has been fascinated people from all ages, walks of life, scientists, miners and tourists for hundreds of years. Indeed, it's also rich in the history of copper mines and quarries, Jacob Bramblethorne added. But that's not why we're here today. I can show you the rest of the Elder Edge any time you like, but currently there are more pressing matters. The ground was still shaking a bit, even though they entered the forest soon enough to hear they sleep. Like the calm before the storm, and I know mind, they expected any moment to see a mighty king with a mighty horse wearing a majestic sword. Though, when they arrived on the spot, the place was empty, save for the face of a wizard in a stone, emblazoned in the rock wall, just as Merlin had provided. 
I thought you would find I've woken up the king, Merlin accused of him. But here we are, and he is nowhere to be found. Patience, Roy, son, said Hugh. It is not a thing you would encounter when you want to experience in haste. For kings who have woken up prematurely might not have been prepared for who they will meet. And you don't have a sword for which to defend yourself. Why is the stone of destiny inside the well with a voice boom from inside the gigantic mossy crag? Say my name, Grace, and your guide moving will be. With shaking hand, push Yemi place the stone inside the well. A load of carved words engraved in a rocky surface. Think of this and take thy fill, for the waters fall by the wizard's will. Thoroughly we will drink, as she says, and suggested. Let us wait for his appearance, for she had replied, and placing her hand upon the water, splashed her face with it, then closed her eyes and spoke the blessed name. Merlin! 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 They all stood back as the ground began to shake once again. As uh, though their giants of the land were now aware of their plight, and they had to partake in the festivities. And suddenly, the ancient stone split straight down as the ancient face within it, and out the small cave was situated beyond the well, a man appeared. What appeared to be a man was in fact a mortal wizard, with an impressive white beard, and a great long blue and green robe, almost glowed like the Lord of Night. It was he that now stepped out of the cave, and stood proud before them. Oh! Your holiness, cried the nuns, and bowed to the ground, and pushed him in the other's knee and sang the dawn reference. Please stand, said Miriam, in a voice as clear as cloudless day, as I am your contemporary, and there is no need to kneel before me. He then approached pushing Dear child of the East, he greeted her with a smile of a thousand songs. You were the salvation of his soul. And he kissed her boy the hand. And pushed Emmy brushed in spite of herself with glee, for she had always fantasized about meeting up someone like Moon, and she never would have expected herself worthy of such an address. Sir Edwin Oakstein, the horn blower, Merlin took Henwin in a firm embrace. You might not have brought much peace and justice to the land. How is this? asked Henwin, who was in shock. I just wanted myself a drink. Don't argue with him, muttered Push Emmy in his ear. Tis Merlin the magician. He can turn to stone. Never you mind, my dear, cried Merlin. Aff we go to Britain's cell to do, where the mighty king and his knights await. Tis nearly the final hours of the summer stroke, so we must make haste. Back in Anglesey, Jacob Bramblethorn spoke for the first time, as though having broken the spell. But we just came from there. His words were cut off by the swirling of leaves and a great gust of wind. And with a blink in an eye, each world is rolled in a circle, and suddenly, Push him, was no longer saw forest surrounding her, but suddenly surrounded by a great green expanse of space, and in front of her was a mound of great green grass, and the mound was glowing, of green and gold, the standing stone in front of it, the same green as you. Where are we, Pushami asked, to which Goosby replied, Prince Selidu is a prehistoric site on the Welsh island of Anglesey, near Lysanil Fan, his name and being a mound in a dark grove. Indeed, indeed, replied Mur, who did not ask where the voice was coming from. You are quite right. Now behold the magic of the summer solstice, and the emerging of King Arthur from sleep. And suddenly the great king appeared, dressed in full din robe, riding in the darkness with a beautiful white horse, a gigantic steed named Lamre, galloping at near full speed towards them. Behind him his knights rode out on horses of their own, and others followed on foot. Hustling towards them. The king bellowed out at once for a pump of his grand stallion. Who oh, has blown a noble horn? Henwin could not answer because he was too shocked to speak. Twas Sir Hugh Steen, sire, Jacob Bramwellborn, who bowed before the great king, spoke first, though I do not believe he knew what he was doing when he did it. Either way, welcome home to our lovely land. You have long been expected for a return, and we are most humbled and honoured to be standing at, kneeling in your presence. Who is that I see King Arthur dismounted his horse? Is that Sir Merlin, my friend Sir Merlin? Tis I, cried Merlin, and the two embraced his long lost brothers. How long has it been, old friend? Oh, seconds to centuries, my boy, said Merlin, with him time ceased to exist. Centuries, cried King Arthur. As his knights gathered round, 
It was strange to see it was a bush. What century are we in currently? It's twenty first, replied he who was in your age, and you are now standing in the land called Wayne. Oh, it was put by England in twelve eighty four, and becomes Queen's own principality. Its own principality, exclaimed King Arthur, and gas were heard from as gas night. No more Great Britain. And now the United Kingdom, sire, exclaimed Jacob Brown, where it is not run by a king. Well, a Prime Minister of Parliament, who is part of the monarch, who is our good queen, and our castle, our dear land of Camelot. Tis another castle in its place, sire. They were called Richmond Castle of North Yorkshire. So go not to surprise the king. Great Scott, cried he, our Camelot is now claimed to be North Yorkshire. There's a country, sire. There's a county, explained Hugh Hoogstein, a subdivision of land overseen by its own court of justice. And what have invaders we defending our soil from? None, proclaimed the great wizard, breathing proudly. Ain't in land is ours. King Arthur shook his head with amazement. Please forgive my son, said he. As it was so bizarre and quite confusing. After a pause, he turned to the murder. Is there no sign of a murder with a great sword of Scalabon? So here, one of the many knights appeared. A well-clad young man who's bearing only one hand. Tis I, Sir Bedivere, they are comely, and life in an arm, who have turned your mighty sword to the lake of the lake, and which thou requested me on your discipline. Now I wonder, if the decision was made in haste, for here you are, and I can swim. Sir Bedivere, my dear gallant old friend, the king clasped hands with the younger man, and drew him forward into a brotherly bear, so make no mistake, you have proven yourself right. And then had mightily and sorely missed thee. At this declaration, Sir Bedivere was practically in tears, as he had been a long time alone before the fairies led him to the chamber door. It is good to be home again, he remarked with profound emotion, and the men around them nodded in agreement. Boy, proclaimed Sir Galahad, which had not been in heaviness or moist, where was hiding with Sir Percival amongst the protection of the fairies to return the hero of the ground. Our dear King Sir Arthur and his merry men, there is no finer joy. King Arthur embraced Sir Galahad, and a fine quest you achieved, said he. Many other knights, such as Sir Percival and Sir Bor, who had valiantly joined King Arthur in his quest to find the Holy Grail, along with Sir Galahad, at once approached and emphatically embraced their dear beloved king, who laughed along with all as they rejoiced with joy. A sound they could make a thousand fairies sing. And those, who are those pretty young lasses who are fortunate enough to prove my sight? King Arthur came towards Pushami and Lauren of it, who bowed and knew respectively. It was Merlin that spoke the introduction. This one here, sire. Merlin proclaimed, is the blessed daughter of the East, who is so gallantly assisted in the reclaiming of your throne, though he alone carried with her the fabled stone of destiny which she placed in a will, and gave us healthy flesh and living blood. More dear, the king took Pushami's trembling hand in his, gave us a gentle kiss. And you are the infamous Mr. Hoogstein, are you not? The king addressed Henry, who was still unable to speak. You, my noble chap, have done the most gallant of deeds, and will be rewarded handsomely. So thank you, sire. Mumbled Henry as he kneeled next to Pushami, who had to humble him gently in the side to get his attention. Now, proclaimed King Arthur, to retrieve Kill Excalibur and gather at our meeting place. Merlin sent me and my men to the Lady of the Lake, who I must contend with to receive my own great sword. <laughs> As thou wish, replied Merlin, and twirling his robe, a gust of wind swirled about King Arthur and his men, and it disappeared. Goodness me, Henry's face was ashen. Where do you think on earth did they all go? To Shropshire, I do believe, replied Merlin, formerly the kingdom of powers. And this, questioned Hugh Hoogstein, who was in shock. Where will they go to re retrieve the mighty sword, Excalibur? Indeed, though I do believe I forgot to tell him. The lake was dried up years ago. The old water, the old wizard tottered with a shake of his head. Hopefully you'll be able to find him. Where will they go then? Pushyami asked with awe. 
To gather round the table in Oxfordshire, replied Merlin, in the secret chamber of the land of the dreaming spires. The land of the dreaming spires, echoed Pushyami, mystified. I think he means the city of Oxford, and I presume you are referring to the night of the round table, he addressed Merlin. But where in the city of Oxford could this fabled table be? Tis in a broadcast rotunda capped with silver, proclaimed Merlin. Oh, to the students of the Bibliotheca Scientifica, where the light of the Lord resides forever in the gallows, where the table round remains. Oh, Lord, whispered Henry, does he mean Oxford University? There's a scientific section at Bodley and Library, nodded Pushy Henry. Maybe there's a hidden room in this library, to which goons be objected. The Radcliffe camera is a building within Oxford University, England, designed by James Gibbs in a neoclassical style and built in 1737. To house the Radcliffe Science Library. Tis right, my friends, said Cried Merlin. Tis true. Now we shall away to Oxfordshire and the magical land of the dreaming spires. And in a blink of an eye, he whisked them off in the blue, in a gathering dust of wind and leaves, leaving behind them in their wake a most de a definitive and miraculous greenish glowing hue. And that concludes the second story of the trilogy. And now we have. Was Shami Goga ready? And the secrets of Radcliffe Camera. Beneath the hollows of the Radcliffe Camera, a secret room that nobody would ever know existed, except for Merlin, was in the sight of the miraculous feast indeed. As King Arthur and his valiant knights, reunited with dear Merlin, once more gathered in a circle where newfound friends, Lady Goga ready and Sir Hugstein, with Lady Lorna, Hugstein the Elder, along with Sir Bramblethorn. They feasted on the finest liquors of the finest meat that only a magician could provide. And thanks to the thirteen treasures of Britain, which were also kept inside the room, for the table day of King Arthur would return. Round an ancient fabled table, they sat. A table made of ancient oak, looked brand new, even though it had been made more than a thousand years ago. The table presented each of the knight's names, engraved in gold embroidery, and was covered in ancient symbols, many of ancient sacred geometry. The table itself seemed to glow, and more than one push Jimmy had to pinch herself as she saw some pieces of meat and the knight's cup levitate before her very eyes. Goodness me! exclaimed Push, uh, exclaimed Henry in an excited undertone. Where, whoever could have thought we'd be here? What a place! It's this company! Hush! whispered Push Jimmy in return fiercely. Let's not question it, lest you break some kind of ancient spell. Are we dreaming? whispered Henry. Not seeming to listen, because I've never in my life seen such a spread. Even our dear friend Augustus could have not dreamt of such things. Tastes real to me, laughed Hu Hoogstein, who was on his third glass of wine, and digging into the best board meat he ever had in his life. This is the life I tell you, the life it is. Duh! Henry whispered as he listened to the king of his night, regaling the ancient tales of victory. Oh, it's a huge score of souls. I wonder if not the Queen and the rest of the world of England should know that some of the cheerful rogues laughing at most maniacally. He who stings waves of barbarians the huge pheasant saw at him. We are with the Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur. Enjoy myself, your lad, because you have earned it. Tis right, agreed Pushy. I mean, who looked more an axe than she had in her long time. Tis a celebration, my love. A victory lap for us all. To sit back, relax, and enjoy. Indeed, being the sister of God, never before in my life have I seen so many miracles. May the saints be praised. The food is divine, remarked Sister Primrose. To the point, I fear it's of the devil's courtship. Not to worry, Sister Primrose, assured the dear abbot's blind. But we are doing the Lord's work here. How is this, Mother Blind? asked Sister Cordelia. We are bearing witness to the celebration welcome the return of England's once world famous king. Exclaimed the elder nun, and no oh, greater joy can I perceive from my wife's great achievement. And you are most welcome in our feast of plenty, proclaimed Merlin, who stood and thanked his drinking chest. We gather here on this great midsummer's eve to celebrate the return of King Arthur of Camelot, who henceforth will reclaim his seat upon the throne during a time of peace amongst the lands, and you, his valiant knights of the round table, whose legacies are revealed by thousands even today for your hero conquests, for a world who forever engraved in the land and the stone of purity and victory. Hurrah, cried Pushemi, 
with her friends among them. But suddenly, a voice that filled the room sounded an alarm through amongst the gathering company his thundering voice of rage calling out a sought after name. Arthur! And suddenly, they understood to greet his old ancestor, the King of Crows, the Lear, son of the great King of the Sea, King of the Horlick, and the noble Bran the Blessed, who had suddenly appeared, as if though by Merlin's hand, and was striding towards with vigor his adversary. Sir Bran, King Arthur, regarded the giant, who stood no more than makes me tail, maybe twelve, and dwarfed everyone else in the room. He's been a long time. Bran the Blessed did not respond at first, except to stand in a quiet rage, or bellowing as he pointed a single finger at the king. You attempted to steal my head. Poppy cook, exclaimed King Arthur. I did no such thing. Ha! Huh, laughed Bran the Blessed. Tis a good thing I happen to know magic, for I transformed myself into a bird of crows, for thou could murder me. And to the shock of all, he ran forth with the intent to kill only to be haunted by Merlin himself. Silence, cried Merlin, but oh, there was no place for bloodshed in this room, as it is the most sacred place, and been blessed by many saints, and whoever sheds any blood here, who oh, well, will befall himself great misfortune, or oh, else cease to be. And Ron the Blessed paused, just evening, curious he could not get his revenge. Why, demanded he, do you seek to remove my head from the blessed hill? To which King Arthur replied, I was going to return your head to Camelot, where we would rule together. To which another voice replied, A raven's head to rule the land nigh. So the king decided the raven should die. So Thomas it decided. It took a lot to shock the great wizard. I recognize their voice. Now come into the light and show thyself at once. The knight stood in turn, as a man clad in green, laughing and smiling like a wide giddy pan, wearing an ancient brown crown of thorn. Appeared out of the darkness. Oh, Mr. Rhymer exclaimed Merlin, are you the one that's solely responsible for all this quite impressive madness? To which Thomas the Rhymer replied with a nod of Bran the Blessed, I mean me rather mad. I'm just sad, but this old lad, whose justice could simply not be had. Justice in the eye of the beholder, plain ruffled King Arthur, you have interrupted our pleasant feast and must be gone. Not with horror ye provide full proof of your sinful deed, proclaimed Bran the Blessed, and with renewed vigour began to charge forth once more, only to be frozen in place and once more by Merlin, who were halt. Now the justice will be served, but first there is to be a test between two kings, in a form of ancient game called the Enchanted Forest. Please note that all who participate in this grand and noble form of combat will be rewarded handsomely. No matter who shall win and who shall lose, to which ran the rest who remain frozen he demanded, understood? Brink once for yes and twice for no. And Bran the rest brinked once in response, with that he became frozen. And just as the knights returned to their seats in white, and poor Shemmy and her friends washed, and as Sir Thomas the Rhymer watched from the wing the large chessboard made out of enchanted oak appeared, its pieces were decorated in gold and silver and his chessboard hovered above the table, which had been cleared, before lowering itself to the table, thanks to. Then, as poor Shammy washed and all, the board began to glow, and King Arthur and King Bran took their separate seats opposite each other. Who just me, exclaimed Henry, while well, everyone else remained hushed, we witnessing a fall of history unfolding before our very eyes. Hush, hissed poor Shammy, her eyes and pants. The game's about to start. The two kings, who were expert players of chess, played the enchanted board with the utmost of ease, and each piece with a vision of purity and truth was restored. And suddenly a checkmate was settled, and King Bran had reigned victory. Weeming proudly stood before the king. I forgive thee, said Bran, as he shook his opponent's hand, for my head remains intact, and so therefore my soul does as well as my pride. Dignity, for which I have sacrificed time and in many of my country. And which means standing on this blessed day, and for that I am eternally grateful to thee, for we both played a hand in protecting and reclaiming it. Shouldn't he know that? began an astonished Henry. Hush! snapped Pushyami, trying hard not to giggle. I am impressed, proclaimed Thomas the Rhymer, 
as he emerged from the shadows. Her eyes hooked out of thrust, but it seems that there are secrets under thy vest. But it turns it is true that we are all entirely blessed. So now boomed the proud voice of Merlin. Let us feast like there is no tomorrow. Men and lady think that we have accomplished the impossible. I have made here the unimaginable ring in the hearts of all that gather here. And so in this grand midsummer eve, I grant the mighty Sir Brian the Blessed the power to resurrect those who are his blood and beloved, and those who have served Thomas the Rhymer, the gift of the magical cauldron of Dernwich, for those no coward no never were. And King Arthur, my son, I give you the gift of invisibility and the form of his mantle, which was always yours. To Sir Hugh Steen the second I present a basket of plenty, so you will never be without. And to Lady Pushy, I mean, I grant you the ring of Elim, whose stone is enchanted by the goddess of the sea, by that very name, and was proved were used by pure of heart, for granting with invisibility. May these gifts from the ancient troll or treasures grant you health and prosperity for all eternity. The knights of the round table bow to the heroes, and they were and music was heard out of nowhere, with invisible instruments that filled the room with ugly transforming it into a dancing ballroom. And throughout the night, a giant feast was had, and there were many great joys, and the white and the red dragons were resting soundly once again. Unbeknownst to the invisible party, two men hid on the outskirts of the yard, listening, their headsets enabling them to hear everything that was incurring in the grand room beneath the grand library. These two men were private investigators, their names were Fox and Sutherland, who had come all the way on this mission from America, the Big Apple itself, as they had been called upon by the Queen herself, after calling the Kitteridge case, where there were some strange going on in the capital city, where the Eighth Raven had been stolen from the Tower of London. The Raven Master was on high alert, as were all the other National Guards, for everyone knew that if the Ravens went missing, or left, the Great Britain would fall. Thankfully, all the other seven were still there, but the original raven, who no one else knew about, but a select few, but this raven never seemed to die. The raven was kept in a secret compartment inside the Tower of London, away from prying eyes, at all costs in the case of the unthinkable, except the unthinkable had just occurred, and someone had reported curious happenings in the yard of the Radcliffe camera. Strange glowing lights were reported by locals. They were coming from the inside of the rotunda, all around the yard. So Fox and Son were in the case. These two men, unbeknownst to the others, had been following a certain trio of individuals, all the way from Dublin, Ireland, and to the Isle of Man, and from there, Oxfordshire. Fox and Sutherland were at the loss, even in Dublin, as to how someone like Miss Bush and Higogaret could know so much in so little time. Yet here she was, at the secret location of the Knights of the Round Table, and it was clear that they were not alone unless they themselves had some of the spirits of King Arthur, and like themselves, had a master of trickery, unlike they had ever seen. They immediately reported to the Queen, who told them to get as much proof as they could of the happenings. They remained hidden all night, listening to the events unfold within the hidden realms, mystified and trying not to panic, as they realised King Arthur was indeed present, as well as his entire crew of knights, and Merlin too. It can't be happening, they thought. It can't be real. Yet here they were, and there was King Arthur, and Bran the Best, and all the rest. And Fox and Sutherland remained hidden until morning, waiting until the first light of either King Arthur, Merlin, or Pushyamic, to emerge from the depths of the Radcliffe camera. In the morning, Merlin decided it was time, so he rounded the troops and told them to meet him outside the rotunda. It was there that Merlin revealed himself to Fox and Sutherland, who were bleary-eyed from lack of sleep, and he said, Tis early, he proclaimed. Moylan! Fox and Sutherland stared immediately at the voice, and when they saw who was standing there, and illuminated above them, they immediately bowed their heads, and kneeled before the ancient wizard. Great Merlin, said Sutherland, we do not mean any harm. We are here on behalf of Queen Elizabeth. We intend to sleep with the king, I am his already. If they're still inside, that's your will. The few stray students who were milling about and getting ready for morning classes stopped and stared to watch this strange theater unfolding. Rise, said Merlin, whose face was obscured by his hood cloak, and follow me. Fox and Sutherland complied immediately, 
and the three disappeared into the Radcliffe camera to the sounds of many shocked and excited whispers. Once inside, they found King Arthur waiting for them in the centre of the library, with his knight standing beside him. Off to one side stood Bran the Blessed, and off to the other stood Thomas the Rhymer. Behind the knights push, Emmy and the others were waiting, completely unsure of what was about to happen next, as Fox and Sutherland approached the group. As they saw King Arthur, they immediately kneeled to the ground, and said with grand emphasis, Oh, hail King Arthur! Oh, long the king! Eyes, King Arthur said, What is your duty here? I am Sir Fox, said Fox, and he is Sir Sutherland. We are here on behalf of the Queen of England, who is presently requesting your appearance in her courtroom as we speak. And your king? demanded King Arthur. Fox looked at Sutherland. We have only a queen. Where is your king? thundered King Arthur, with consternation. There is no king, stammered Sutherland. We only have a queen. She alone is our monarch. We have had a queen since the fifties, I believe. King Arthur looked a long time more than Where is the meaning of this? he demanded. Am I to be king, or is there no room for a queen? The king, it is up to the queen, said Merlin simply. That is how it has been now for many years. Then I will speak with her, said King Arthur. Merlin, take us to her immediately. As you wish, my son, said Merlin. And King Arthur and the knights up disappeared in the blink of an eye. But, Fox sputtered, we have to let her know because we're coming. Excuse us, said Sutherland hastily, and let us make a call. The two disappeared momentarily before returning, looking flustered. However, their demeanour shifted as soon as they caught sight of Push Emmy standing off to the side with her friends, the three nuns. Miss Gilgareddy, said Sutherland, bowing towards her. You, presence, requested at Buckingham Palace, and Sir Henry's is too. You, hang and look faint, do you know who I am, but, but how? He blew the horn that woke the king, declared Fox with a smile that extended his hand to some. And with a bow, you were to be given a medal of honour, as is Miss Gold already, for your contributions to history. You sure have changed the course of history. But, Henry stammered, practically beside himself, I really just wanted to make a name. Make myself a drink. Oh, please, tell me this just isn't a drink, but I sure do feel like I'm, I'm dreaming. Ow! He yelled when Laura pinched his forearm, and when he scowled at her in response, she giggled dangerously, like a TV schoolgirl. Sorry, been back, Lauren. Okay, Henry muttered. I ain't dreaming. Where's this all happening now? What does it mean for us? You, dear boy, been something that you, miss. You've been declared national heroes. And so it was that Miss Pushyami Gogoretti and Sarah Henwin Hoosey was given the Medal of Honor. The Queen herself, Miss Gogoretti, for locating a missing book of kings and then for assisting in the discovery of King Arthur. Out to the round table, and Merlin, and then for discovering upon the ancient relic that was the home, waking up sleeping King Arthur, the knights at the round table, returning hope to all the lands, and King Arthur and his knights were given the choice of any castle they wanted. King Arthur chose Tintagel, castle of his birth, and while he was disheartened to see it in the ruins, he would rejoice when Merlin restored it to its original state, and King Arthur could once again reside with his faithful men by the sea. Bran the Blessed returned to his castle, Dinas Bran, where he resurrected his wife Anna, his son Caradol, his brother Marowyn, and his sister Branwen, whose ashes his head was buried with. Those were the ones he could locate, and those were the family he lived with by the sea. And before he left the Buckingham Palace, the Lady Pushemi, Sir Henry, his Lady Lorna, and the three nuns, along with Sir Hugh Hughesley, Jacob Brambletorn, Take it, St. Margaret's holy womb, and Pinsy, only to be immersed in its holy waters as a thank you for your hard work. The well was, in fact, a shrine to take to St. Fry's wife, the patron saint of Oxford, who escaped a painful past to live with nuns and became a saint. Joining them was Sir Galahad, who was raised by nuns as a boy, and Merlin, who was raised by a single mother who was also a nun. Sister Bly, Sister Primrose, and Sister Cordelia all were tears of joy as they all held hands to a simple English prayer. And for all that had come before, and all that had come to pass, may your joys be as bright as the morning, may your years of happiness be as numerous as the stars in the heaven, 
and may your troubles be nothing but shadows that fade in the sunlight of love. And that concludes the final tale of Pushyami Gogoreli and the Cradle of Wales, the trilogy, the, the UK trilogy. And tune in next time for one more off the chain trilogy coming from Pushyami. But before that, the wife got excited about doing an original Henwin Hoogstein trilogy. So that's coming before you know it. And we'll play a little game here. See if we can get it before all these leaves fall off these trees. We'll have a little fun with this. And hopefully, and have a wonderful evening, all of you fine people. And if you like this content, tune in, like, and subscribe. Tell your friends. And we, we want this content to be a joy for all mankind. And if you like it, tune in for more content written by me and my wife. Written by Timothy Vauber and Sarah Kaplan. Written by Sarah Kaplan and Timothy Vauber. And original music by me and comedy by me.